morning. This is that time that I let that get out of your head. We're going to change moves when we have this first song. We'll come back to that and see that later. Right now, let's stay in the scene. Ancient of Days. You know, as you get older, that stand gets farther and farther away. I, I heard other people, oh, really, you know, older people say that. Blessing and honor. Blessing and honor, glory and power be to the ancient of days. From every nation, all of creation will bow before the ancient of days. Every tongue in heaven and earth shall declare your glory, every knee shall bow at your throne in worship you will be exalted O god and your kingdom shall not pass away O ancient of days your kingdom shall reign over all the earth sing to the ancient of days for none can compare to your matchless worth. Sing to the ancient of days. Every tongue in heaven and earth shall declare your glory. Every knee shall count. In worship you will be exalted, O God. And your kingdom shall not pass away, O ancient of days. Your kingdom shall reign over all the earth. Sing to the ancient of days. For none can compare to your matchless worth. Sing to the ancient of days. Your kingdom shall reign over all the earth. Sing to the ancient of days. For none can compare to your matchless worth. Sing to the ancient of days. Your kingdom shall reign over all the earth. Sing to the ancient of days. For none can compare to your matchless worth. Sing to the ancient of days. Sing to the ancient of days. Sing to the ancient of days. May be seated. Welcome to worship. Wow. And as we sang that song, and it was talking about gathering around the throne to worship. You know, that's something we as Christians, we look forward to. That time when, when we're gathered around the throne with, with all of God's people uh, worshiping. And, and as we gather today to worship, we are gathering with them. We are worshiping the same God. We're not around the throne, but what we are doing is we're worshiping with those who have gone before, we're worshiping with the angels as we worship today. 
Now I understand as we come into worship that there are a lot of things that we bring uh, in with us. You know, we may not be carrying a bag, but there's baggage that we bring to worship. There, there are hurts. There are, there are joys that we are thankful for. There are uh, uh, maybe, maybe things that have happened in your week, or maybe things that, that have happened a long time ago that you were reminded of this week. And, and we want to go before God, and we want to give those to the Lord. And I want to invite you, if you would like, to come and join me up here up front. As we, as we gather to pray and as we seek the face of this ancient of days. Won't you join me up here this, this morning? the God of glory, the God of majesty, the God of grace, the God of mercy, the God who gives joy and who gives peace. You are the God who heals and you are the God who disciplines. Father, I thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to come before your throne and join the angels and those who have gone before as we worship you this morning. Father, I pray that our worship would be filled with your spirit and your truth. Father, I pray as we, as we come before your throne for those who have come carrying, carrying hurts, carrying pain, carrying ah, ah, so many things. God, I pray that we would leave it at your mercy seat. <coughs> Lord, you are the God who desires our worship, for you know we will worship something, and only you are worthy. And so, Father, as we worship you this morning, Holy Spirit, guide us as we lift up the sun. And as he's lifted up, I pray men and women, boys and girls, would be drawn to him. Lord, it's in the precious name of your holy son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. stand again together to sing. Thank you. 
lightning rolls of thunder. Let's see an on strength and glory and power be. Awestruck wonder at the mention of your name. Jesus, your name is power, breath and living water, such a marvelous mystery. Praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing. Praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. This morning is from the 21st Psalm. Lord, the King finds joy in your strength. How greatly he rejoices in your victory. You have given him his heart's desire and have not denied the request of his lips. For you meet him with rich blessings. You place a crown of pure gold on his head. He asked you for life and you gave it to him. Length of days forever and ever. His glory is great through your victory. You confer majesty and splendor on him. You give him blessings forever. You cheer him with joy in your presence. For the king relies on the Lord. Through the faithful love of the Most High, he is not shaken. <clears throat> I told you this one was coming. Let's sing. I heard an old, old story How a Savior came from glory How he gave his life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard around his groaning Of his precious blood
Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Sing all earth His wonderful love proclaim. Hail Him, hail Him, highest archangels in glory. Strength and honor give to His holy name. Like a shepherd, Jesus will guard His children in His arms. He carries him all day long. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him, ever in joyful song. Praise him, praise him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. For our sins he suffered and bled and died. He our rock, our hope of eternal salvation. Hail him, Hail him, Jesus the crucified. Praises, Jesus who bore sorrows, love unbound and wonderful, deep and strong. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him, ever in joyful song. Praise him, praise him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Heavenly portals, loud will those angels ring. Jesus, Savior, reigneth forever and ever. Crown him, crown him, prophet and priest and king. Christ is coming over the world victorious. Faith and glory unto the Lord belong. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent greatness. Praise Him, praise Him, ever in joyful song. If you have your copy of God's Word, there you go, Jacob. If you have your copy of God's Word, if you have your Bible with you, if you'll turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to be reading from verses 12 through 27. We're, we're looking at the church, the, what uh, the Bible has to say about the church. We're going to get a little specific and, and, and look at uh, when... Is this in my notes? It is in my notes. So I'll just wait and get to it when I get there. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning in verse 12. If you don't have your Bibles with you, it's 
would be up on the screen. For just as the body is one and has many parts, and all the parts of that body, though many, are one body, so also is Christ. For we, for we were all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all given one spirit to drink. Indeed, the, whole, the body, I'm, I'm kind of like Ray now, I'm going to have to sit down a little bit so I can see this. Indeed, the body is not one part, but many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body, is it not for that reason? It is not for that reason, less, any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it is not for that reason any less part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? And as it is, God has arranged each one of the parts of the body just as he wanted. And if they were all the same part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. Or again, the head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that are weaker are indispensable. And those parts of the body that we consider less honorable, we clothe these with greater honor, and our unrespectable parts are treated with greater respect, which our respectable parts do not need. Instead, God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the less honorable, so that there would be no division in the body, but that the members would have the same concern for each other. So if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. And now you are the body of Christ and individual members of it. Father, thank you for the, for the body. Thank, thank you that you have given us the church. God, I pray that we as the church at First Baptist Bridgetown would be the church that you have called us to be. The body, your body, working in this world. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If 2020 taught us anything, it's the necessity of the church in the life of the believer. You know, uh, you know that short period of time we were separated, which we're celebrating next week, uh, having, you know, we had that little period of time there at Christmas, but we started back uh, next week, uh, a year ago next week. That, but that short period of time we were separated, even though we gathered the best we could through technology, helped us to see the value of regular physical attendance for worship and for Bible study and for ministry. If we didn't before, we came to realize that the church was more than just a Sunday morning gathering. It's, it's a fellowship. You know, we gather on Sunday mornings and, and, and we gather to, to worship and to study, but we also gather to pray with each other and, and, and to uh, support each other. In Acts chapter 2, verse 42, it says that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. So this morning as we look at the doctrine of the church, uh, we're, I want us to look at some distinctive elements of a New Testament church. And we're going to look at more than just the makeup of the church. We're going to look at the membership of a church. You know, Scripture uses several different metaphors for the church. Uh, it's the uh, people of God, the temple of God, the bride of Christ. But the metaphor that we're going to look at this morning is what we just read about, the, the body of Christ. The body of Christ. And, and the passage told us that that body is made up of many members. Now, a doctor, when he's in medical school will have to take a lot of anatomy. You know, it's, they don't just learn the, uh, the knee bones connected to the thigh bone, the thigh bones connected to the hip bone. They don't just learn that. They, they learn all of the different muscles. They learn all of the different nerves. They, 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 they have to study anatomy. And they get down, and the reason they study all these different parts and how each of them work together is so that they can know how the body should. 
And so we're going to look at all the different parts this morning to see how the body should work. One more thing. I understand that some of you have come from churches other than a Baptist church. And we have lots of different backgrounds in this church as, as we gather for worship. Uh, to help you understand how we as uh, First Baptist Ridgetop believe, we're going to be looking at the Baptist <coughs> distinctives as far as uh, what concerning the church. And each Baptist distinctive, I'm going to give you scriptural background for what, for what we believe because we don't just believe it just to be different. We believe it because these are the way we believe that scripture is leading us to believe. So let's dig in. The first thing we need to see is that the scripture uh, presents the church in two forms. The first form is the universal church. The universal church. The scripture uses the word ecclesia to describe the church. And the word is the joining of two words, the two-letter word at, which means out, and kaleo, it's a form of kaleo, which means to call. And so the church literally means those who are called out. So we are being called out. We're the ones who are being called out, separated from the world. And that word ecclesia, ecclesia is used 114 times in Scripture. 13 of those references are talking about the universal church. When Jesus is talking with Peter and he says, I will build my church, that is an example of that. That is that universal church. But when Jesus is talking about um, how to deal with a difference between brothers, and he says, bring it before the church, he's not talking about the universal church there. He's talking about the local church. And so this universal church includes all born-again people with different, within different churches. You know, we're... we're uh, we're to be a, a group of people that God has called out from the world that <coughs> carry out the work of salvation through the power of Jesus Christ. The universal church is inaugurated after Jesus' resurrection at Pentecost as recorded in Acts chapter 2. We see the mighty rush of wind, the fire, the tongues of fire that landed on all of the people. And, and then um, they were speaking in different languages. When it says speaking, the, I think the King James calls it, calls it speaking in different tongues. They were speaking in different languages. They were sharing the gospel in languages that were not native to them. And the people hearing it could hear the gospel in their own <coughs> language. This was, this was a miracle of the Holy Spirit that began the church. But he's not only talking about the universal church, it's also talking about the local church. As I said, Jesus talked about the local church in, in Matthew 18 when he was talking about settling the difference between brothers. The local church is a group of believers covenanted together around, around the following. The worship according to his word. You know, worship is the ultimate form of the great commandment. You know, we're commanded to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our mind, with all our strength, and with all our spirit. And, and, and that whole thing can be summed up in, in worship. That is the ultimate uh, form of that commandment. Ministry to believers by the word. This is our obedience to the great commission to make disciples and to love one another. And the second commandment, to love one another. And ministry to the word, to the world through the word. And we love our neighbors by sharing the gospel with them and, and by showing God's mercy in their need. You know, we'll, we're going to be, for the rest of the sermon, though, we're going to be focusing on the local church. The local church. God gave the local church two ordinances. Baptism being one of them. Baptism being one of the ordinances. And baptism is an act of obedience. You know, the Great Commission commands us as to make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. You know, as Baptists, we believe that Scripture teaches a believer's baptism. The New Testament reveals a pattern. 
If you look at the New Testament, you're going to see this pattern of people who were baptized after they believed. And so we believe in a believer's baptism. We also believe that baptism is by immersion, and here's why. Here's why. When every time you see baptize in your, in your English Bible, every time you see the word baptize in your English Bible, I want you to understand that's not a translation from the Greek. That's called a transliteration. They basically took the Greek word and put English letters on it. The Greek word is baptizo. And so they said, okay, we're going to put, take, instead of translating it like we've translated every other word in that sentence, we're going to just put English letters on it and call it baptized. Why? What, what, what's behind that? Well, I'm not going to get into the why, but let me tell you what's behind that. The word, the translation of the word baptizo is to immerse. Or to dip. There is a uh, in um, the 200s, uh, 200 AD, uh, a a there was this Greek leader who had this recipe for making pickles. How many of you have ever made pickles? All right. It says that you baptizo the pickles in vinegar. And you baptizo the pickles in boiling water. Now, you all who make pickles understand you put the pickles in there. And that's what the scripture is talking about. And this is why we hold to an immersion baptism as Baptists. Uh, and, and baptism, also baptism by immersion, is the best picture of Christ's burial and resurrection. Baptism is not just an act of obedience, it's an act of entrance. Uh, our text tells us that we're all baptized in one, into one body. We're all baptized into one body. That would be the baptism of the Holy Spirit that we receive when we are saved. But baptism, or our physical baptism that we do uh, in the water, signifies both the entrance into the universal and eternal body of Christ and into membership in the local church which baptizes you. And so baptism is an act of entrance. But it's also an act of allegiance. When we, when we submit for baptism, it declares to the world our allegiance to Christ. There are certain parts of the world where a person can say that they are a Christian. They can study their Bible all they want. They can do all that they want to do until they are publicly baptized. When they are publicly baptized, then their life is in danger. Because they have publicly declared they are no longer whatever the form of faith they were. When we are publicly baptized, we're declaring we are no longer of uh, the world. We are no longer Satan's. We belong to Christ. So, the other uh, ordinance that God has given us uh, is the Lord's Supper. We, we Look at the Lord's Supper, and I'm going to go through this one quickly, as our, identif our identification with Christ's death. We, we identify as, as we take the Lord's Supper, we're, we're taking the body of Christ, we're taking uh, the symbolic blood of Christ, and, and we're, we're taking those, we're identifying with the uh, death of Christ. But we're not only identifying with his death, we're proclaiming his death and his resurrection. It is an act of, of, of um, witness. And finally, it also proclaims our hope in Christ's return. Every, son, every time we take the Lord's Supper, or, or a lot of times we take the Lord's Supper, I read uh, 1 Corinthians 11, where it says, As often as you take this, you proclaim his death until, his, until he comes. So we're proclaiming our hope in Christ's return. All right. So, as we continue to look at the local church, we're now going to look at the different members of the local church. And the local church is made up of members. Just like our body is made up of members, and we have all these muscles and bones and ligaments and, 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 and everything that make, make our hands move and, and you know, 
um, make our make our bodies move. You know, I've got a knee that that is missing some some a little bit of uh, um, cartilage, and so it hurts sometimes, and it swells up. And, and so, you know, these are things that I'm learning about as I get older. Parts of you know, have you noticed that as you get older, you learn more about parts of your body. You know, the scripture ends this passage by saying, "Now you're the body of Christ and individual members of it." Paul's addressing issues at the church of Corinth. Among those issues are factions fighting within the church. It's a, it's a church divided. They were a, apparent divisions based on wrong beliefs and sin and the proper handling of it and race. And, and there were all of these divisions going on in the church in Corinth. And Paul was writing the letter to the church in Corinth to, to address these divisions. And he wrote them to remind them that the church, that they were members one of another. And as we look at the overview of this passage, we're going to see that church membership is expected. Church membership is expected. The very analogy of a single body with many, many members shows that God's design for the church is to have membership. You're expected to be a member of a local church as a Christian. For the body is made up of many members. And if a member is no longer a part of that body, then the member is not, you know, it, it kind of isn't as useful. It's the body. Church membership, though, is more than a name on a roll. It's more than a name on a roll. I've had people tell me uh, that membership is just putting your name on a piece of paper. Well, why should I become a member? It's just putting your name on a piece of paper. Yeah, so is marriage. So is marriage. You can choose to live with the, with the person that you love, or you can choose to get married as God intended. Church membership is more than just putting your name on a piece of paper. It's a commitment. It's a covenant together. To covenant together. Church membership is a commitment to the members of the church and to obedience to Christ's design for the church. It's a commitment to other members of the church and an obedience to Christ's design for the church. And it's also, church membership consists of regular giving to the ministry of the church. We give freely. As members of this church, we have to participate. We give freely of our time, of our resources, of ourselves to further the ministry of a local church. So we look at our scripture passage. We see that the membership needs to be unified. Remember, Paul is calling this church out for their divisions. He, there are all sorts of divisions, whether it's Un unconfessed sin and, and uh, uh, idolatry and, and other divisions, Jews fighting against Greeks, and, and all of these things were happening within the church at Corinth, and, and the church that is divided is dying. And churches aren't divided because they're dying. Churches die because they're divided. And so a church has to be unified. So what do we need to be unified around? We need to be unified by the gospel. That's the very first thing. We need to be unified by the gospel. Our sole purpose for existence is to share the gospel and to make disciples who can share the gospel and make disciples. That's what? That's, a, that's the Great Commission. Make disciples who can share the gospel and teach the word, who make disciples, who make disciples, who make disciples. That is the purpose for the church. So we're unified around the gospel. We're also unified by the Holy Spirit. Verse 13 tells us that for we were all baptized by one spirit into one body. God's Holy Spirit lives in us, leading us and guiding us. And when we follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit isn't divided. 
If we're all following the Holy Spirit and the leadership of the Holy Spirit, and we're, we're discerning whether what we are the following is the Holy Spirit or our own desires or something else, and we look to the Holy Spirit, we're going to be unified. Church membership, though, is unified, but it's not uniform. I love this church. Sitting in this congregation, we have people from, from four different continents. I love this church. We are different. We have different races. I love this church. We don't have to be all the same to be unified. We can celebrate our differences. Paul mentions that the four main people groups that would make up a church in his day, the Jew, the Greek, the slave, and the free. When Paul looks at the church, he sees a body with many members working together as one. And we, you know, we have many members. We have these feet and legs and arms and hands and, and ears. And they were all placed there by God so that we can function as God designed us. You know, it, each member is unique. Not only is the eye different from the ear and the hand, but the two eyes are different. Because of where they are placed in the head, they see different perspectives. That is how we get depth perception. Now I'm going to tell you a little bit about my wife. I hope she doesn't mind. Don't, don't go up to her and tell her I told her that. I'll tell her. But my wife, when she was younger, she had an eye that was a point that was not working correctly. It, it, she could see out of it, but it wasn't working correctly. And it was a few years, she was older, before she had corrective surgery. But her brain developed to the point where it only looked at one eye. It only saw what one eye was sending it at a time. One eye at a time. So Annette has no depth of perception. Both eyes are working, but they're not working together. You see, we are, we are unified, but we're not uniform. Church member is necessary. Verse 15, verse 17 tells us that um, if the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell, smell be? We, you know, we can't all be the same. We're all needed. A church member is necessary. When a member of our body shuts down and ceases to function, we call that member disease. We call, and, and in the same way, when a member looks at the church and says, you know, I'm not needed, and it shuts down, it's the result of a disease, and that disease is called sin. We, we need to understand that we're all needed. We're all necessary. You are here because you bring your uniqueness to the body. Each one of us brings something different to the membership. Look around you. There is no one who has your exact spiritual gifting. There is no one else who has your passions. There is no one else who has your abilities. There is no one else who has your personality. There is no one else who has had your experiences. You bring those into the body and God uses those. Teresa, can I tell them what's coming up in the fall? Many, many men and women have gone through the, the pain of, of divorce or separation and they're living um, and they don't understand how to deal with it. And so Teresa Esslinger does, has agreed and she has been training to lead a divorce care. She's taking her experiences, her personality, her, her knowledge, and she's putting it to work in the life of the church. But we're going to start that this uh, August, I think is correct. August. I think it's August 18th. Is that right? We're going to start that August 18th. So if you know somebody who's going through the pain of divorce and, and they just need some support, they need some knowledge, Teresa is doing that. You see, she is bringing 
all of that. One of our newest members is bringing all of that she is into the, the work of the body of Christ. So church membership is by God's design. You know, the scripture tells us that we're fearfully and wonderfully made, that God knit us together in our mother's womb. And, and just like our natural bodies, God puts the church together, works to intricately design the church body and his church. And he doesn't bring you here just to be fed. Now, as the pastor, I have inherited Peter's command, Jesus commanded Peter to feed the sheep. That's my job, to feed the sheep. And I will do that every opportunity you afford me. And I will, if I'm not feeding you personally, I will have people feeding me. Not just on Sunday morning, but uh, on Wednesday night and on, on uh, other days. But you're here to use your uniqueness as part of the local body of believers and to share the gospel and, and to make help make disciples. Church membership is God's design and it's connected. It's totally connected. This is, if, if you haven't heard anything else, and I, I hope you have, we see in verse 21, the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. Or the head cannot, can't say to the feet, I don't need you. We are connected. We need each other. We need each other. Paul is using the body analogy to tell the church of Corinth and us that we are interconnected. The body can compensate for the loss of a part, but will never work again as the way God designed it. The same is true for the church. When a member of God is put into the membership of the church, drops out and doesn't function the way God intended for them to function, the body, the church, doesn't function the way God intended for it to function. There is a hole. It doesn't matter how little you think you contribute. You might think, well, you know, I, I, can't, I can't do what I used to do. Maybe you're older and say, I can't do what I used to do. That's okay. You have a wealth of knowledge and, 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 and I have found that my favorite people I have praying for me are those older saints who have learned how to pray through a lifetime of prayer. You might think, well, I'm, I'm a new Christian. I don't, I, what can I do? Oh, there's so many things that you can do. We need people on the door, smiling faces, greeting people every Sunday morning. We, you know, uh, you can hold a door for somebody. You can hold a door for somebody. I had a new believer at another church. She was pregnant, and it was obvious. She was not married, but she was a new believer. And she says, Pastor, what can I do? That, that pregnant lady held the door for everybody who came in. Smiled and held the door for everybody who came in. And agreed with it. You see, we can... You, there is nothing, nothing. The church needs you. And we, you are indispensable. God tells you that you are indispensable in verse 22. He says, on the contrary, those parts of the body that are weaker are indispensable. We not only need each other, we support each other. When one suffers, we all suffer. Verse 26. When one suffers, we all suffer. You felt it before. Have you ever been hammering? And you're holding a nail, and you're hammering, and you're hammering, and you're hammering, and you hit the wrong nail? It's so hard that your teeth hurt? That ever happened to you? Your teeth are suffering with your thumb. They are supporting each other. We need to support each other. We are here to support each other. We need to be like that with each other. That interconnectedness requires us to get to know each other as members of the church. A 
it requires us not to limit ourselves to just one hour a day, a week, to get to know each other. You know, in, in Acts chapter 2, it says, it tells us that they were gathering daily for meals and to minister to them. <coughs> you know, we have a group that goes out on Sunday, most Sundays, to eat. Uh, I invite you to join us. I say most Sundays because Annette and I won't be able to go this week, but next week we'll be right here. Let's share each other's stories. Let's get to know each other. And when one rejoices, we all rejoice. In verse 26, it tells us, if one member is honored, then all the members rejoice with it. There's no envy, there's no ego, there's no strife. We all rejoice. We need to share our joy as well as our pain. There's only joy in the church. You know, Jesus said, I will build my church. And he's specifically talking about the universal church, but um, the universal church is made up of local churches. And so I believe that it is Jesus who builds this church. He has commanded me, he's commanded us to make disciples. That's the great commission. But he says, I will build my church. My question is, Are you a faithful covenant member of all the church? Giving, your, giving of yourself, your time, your resources to the ministry of that church. We have people here who have been visiting with us and been attending with us and been a part of us. Not just visiting, attending and a part of us. But you've not made that step yet. Let me encourage you to consider making that step. I would love to talk to you about that if, if you don't want to do it today. But I would love for you to covenant with us, to be a part, to, to take that step and, and commit and covenant with us. Church membership requires first local church membership first requires a membership in Christ's universal church. And that requires that you put your trust in Jesus Christ for salvation. That's the very first thing. That you have, you have put your trust in Christ and God to Him and He's done a work in your heart. Changing you. What Jesus described being born again. If that hasn't happened in your heart, then today I invite you to come. Come to Jesus. Why don't you come to Jesus? Pray with me. Father, thank you for this church. Thank you for those that you have brought. Father, I pray that you would help us to be the church that you would have us to be. Lord, at this time, we're at the time of, of commitment where we offer ourselves a holy and living sacrifice. May your spirit work during this time. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So we stand and sing, I am resolved. How's the Lord leading you this morning?
ahead and be seated. I have um, uh, Miranda's going to come and do some announcements, but be, as, as she's getting getting up here, uh, I want to tell you about something that's happening this week, and you may have seen it on the news. The Southern Baptist Convention is meeting in Nashville. You will hear a lot about what is going on at the Southern Baptist Convention. You will hear the news will will tell you all these things about the fracturing that's going on, about how uh, there's cover-ups going on, about how all this is happening. And, and true, this has been all over social media. It's been all over the news. But let me tell you what happens when the Southern Baptist Convention gets together. It's, I, I was reminded of this by a, a, uh, something that I posted three years ago. The, uh, uh, um, a CNN reporter says, I covered the Southern Baptist Convention all week expecting to hear divisions and, and all of these things. He says, what I heard was a focus on church planting, a focus on evangelism, a focus on sending missionaries. And that's what we're about. And we as a Southern Baptist church, we need to be praying for our convention. What happens there affects us some. But as a local church, we're not a hierarchical dimension, de uh, denomination. There is, there is nobody between us and God. There is nobody between us and God. There is no ruling power between us and God. What we do is what we do. And so what happens at the Southern Baptist Convention, what you hear, while it will affect us somewhat, will not affect us in a major way. Just be in prayer for your Southern Baptist Convention. Matt and, and Miranda and I are going as your messengers. And we're going to, uh, if for those who want to hear, I will give a report at the end when it's when it's over after Wednesday. So, uh, um, that having been said, I am going to have the last word after you're done. <coughs> Hello, um, I'm here to talk about much more pleasant things. Um, so we are still doing our campaign for uh, fundraising for the elevator our Rise Up campaign for our lift. Um, you guys have graciously donated. We are now 63% of the way towards our goal as a church. Um, but we are still needing funds. We believe that if we can meet our goal, that uh, we have um, places that we can uh, get the rest of the money from. But this is truly an outreach opportunity. There are people that would come to our church and be a part of our community, but they cannot get upstairs. And there are already enough barriers to Christ. Stairs does not need to be one of them. So we encourage your donations. Uh, after that, Backyard Kids Club. Oh, boy, am I excited to talk to you about this again. Woo! So a lot of you have been saying that you would like to help. Put me where you need me. Put me where you need me. Let me tell you, my brain is not that organized. So what I have is some sign-up sheets on the table that you pass as you're leaving the sanctuary. You know, you're heading out the door, and there's that little table on your right when you're going out the back on a bright blue poster board. There are sign-up sheets for all three locations. And you can put your name down next to music, crafts, rec, or being a rotator, which just means you go around to each spot with the kids. You don't have to prepare anything. You're just going to help the little ones with the craft. You're going to help them understand the game. If you want to serve and you want to be a part of reaching our community, of growing our church, and reaching the next generation for Christ, your name should be on that list somewhere. And I, and I'm, I, I appreciate that. We are hoping to get um, all spots filled uh, and signed up by the end of Sunday next week. Um, so if you've been thinking about it, I know I've been talking about it for a while, put your name down. And we will put you to work. I'm still providing everything that you need. Um, if you're doing rec, you don't have to come up with any games. You don't have to come up with any supplies. I'm going to give all of it to you. Same with music, crafts, whichever. I got you covered. I just need your smiling, wonderful self. 
and now I've, I've gone on about this enough. We have family photos, June 24th through the 26th. Um, sign up with Teresa Esslinger. There she is, she's lovely. Um, if you get your family photo taken, not only will you have the opportunity to have a copy, but we are hoping to put them in a directory. So if you see your church members' names and you can't remember what they look like, this will help. Yes. Okay, and do we have any more announcements? Uh, young adult group, woo! So if you are young adult and not just young in spirit, if your body is physically young, but over the age of 18, okay? We have a new thing for you. June 28th, it's going to be at Ralph's house. So if you've ever wanted to be a nosy person, get to come do that. We're going to hang out on his porch, get to know each other, talk about what the future of a college and young adult group would look like for us. And this is for high school graduates to age 30. All welcome. Please come and join us. I don't want to just talk to Jacob and Ralph. I want you to come. And do we have anything else? Oh, choir interest meeting. I know that some of you guys are missing the choir, and I can hear from some of your singing that you should be in the choir. Mm -hmm. If that is something that interests you, we are have a meeting Wednesday, July 21st at 7.30. You can meet with Ray, and we're going to talk about getting the choir back together, getting y'all up there, because we're tired of looking at just Ray. We are. All right, what else do we have on our... All right, we're good. Here's Ralph. <laughs> I never get that. Um, I'm going to do something that he doesn't want to do, but I'm going to ask you to do it with me anyway. Chester. Chester is having a procedure tomorrow uh, on his heart. Come here, Chester. Come here, Chester. <laughs> yes, you will. You, you'll have every right. Come here. Chester is having a, a, a heart procedure tomorrow, a heart catheter tomorrow. And? <laughs> While we're trusting God, while we're trusting God to, to take care of Chester, we want to we pray for Chester. Uh, James says that uh, if any of us are ill, that we're to call and, and have the elders of the church, and we're going to ask the church that wants to come and we're going to lay hands on Chester. And we're going to pray for Chester for tomorrow. All right? And then we're going to end with uh, Because He Lives. So if you'll come and come and join me. And, and Chester, I need you to pray here. And we're going to be praying. We're going to be praying. We're going to be praying for both of you. You come on over here. We're going to be praying for all of you. Yahweh Rafa is your name. I am Yields. And so, Father, I pray for your healing hand on Chester. God, that uh, just like the last time, they're going to go in and they're going to say, you know, what we're seeing is, is the heart is healing itself. But God, we're also praying right now for the doctors and nurses that you give them a good night's sleep tonight, that they are rested tomorrow, that you give them strength. I pray for every patient that they work on, uh, not just Chester. I pray your, your strength and your grace on Chester as he, continue, as he prepares for tomorrow. And Father, we lift up Kathy and, and uh, their daughters to you, and, and we just ask, Father, that you give them your grace and your strength. Father, you are a, a wonderful God, and we love you, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
to him. Because he 